I think it's, a, it's an interesting... Uh, I hope you understand his English. Uh, he comes from down under. <laughs> so, uh, Peter is... Uh, we, we have such an uh, incredible, diverse international group of staff uh, that we, we have people speaking various different dialects of English, actually. <laughs> and uh, when we had an MC, we were sort of... Running, Do I, does everybody even understand? No, sorry. But he's doing a great job. Um, thanks for, for joining us for this uh, opening plenary session. And uh, we really gathered together a, a stellar, um, stellar uh, panel uh, for this. Uh, again, I don't think you really need an introduction, but I, I have to go through the motions at least. Um, uh, seated immediately to my left is uh, Dr. Ken uh, Lieberthal, who's a senior fellow in foreign policy and global economy and development at the Brookings uh, Institution. He's, he's uh, one of the leading scholars, uh, uh, policy experts on, on China. Um, but he's also actually produced uh, many, many Korean students, uh, Korean experts on, on, on Chinese uh, affairs as well. And uh, it's great to, to have uh, uh, Dr. Liv with us. Um, sitting next to him is uh, Dr. Chung Jae-ho, who is the professor of international relations at Seoul National University. Uh, I don't think anybody would, would, would contest my, my statement that he, he is the leading uh, uh, China specialist in, in Korea, uh, especially on the relations between the United States and, and China. And of course, a word of congratulations to him. He just won a major prize from the Korean uh, International uh, Studies Association. No, it actually has won a big, uh, it comes with a big monetary prize as well, as I understand it. <laughs> He's been getting all these... Uh, demands to, to, uh, to have him buy dinner for, for people. That's the Korean way. When you win something, you always have to buy for others. Um, uh, last but not least, of course, is Professor Jin San Rong, who is Dep Deputy President and Professor in the School of International Studies at uh, Renmin University of, of China, a frequent visitor to, to Korea, a great friend of Korea. Uh, we've had many, many um, uh, important uh, discussions. Um, he has a PhD from uh, uh, international politics from the School of International Studies at, at Beijing and a BA from Fudan University. Um, what, what I'd like to do this uh, is what we always try to do in, in uh, Asan uh, sessions such as this is to make it as, as much of a conversation as possible. And I, I think for, for all the panelists, uh, like for all the panelists, we've asked that that they don't prepare a paper, that there's no PPT, no PowerPoint. Uh, this is going to be a free-flowing conversation. So I'll just start throwing out uh, questions at them, and we'll just go in the order uh, that they're seated, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll start the uh, conversation going, and we'll try to open it to the audience as, as quickly as we can. Um, so let me start with the, the, with the first question. Um, I guess... Uh, the, the it should be the standard question, but perhaps also maybe even the most important. What is the historical significance of the of the current transition, political transition that is taking uh, place? What is what is the meaning uh, that uh, that you see uh, uh, behind this this transition? Let's start with Ken. Okay, I have about seven minutes to answer yes, that question. Yes, you only have right? about okay. seven minutes. <laughs> uh, look, let, let me put it very simply. I think China is at a major turning point. Uh, Bill Overholt's uh, presentation teed this up uh, to some extent. Uh, what they've been doing, uh, they cannot continue doing for a long time without paying an increasingly large price for it. So let me put the transition in, in those terms and give a few details to try to tee up uh, this conversation. I think the new leaders coming in know that they need to make major structural reforms. Structural reforms are broadly outlined in the 12 five-year plan that was adopted more than a year ago. Uh, to make those reforms will also require making significant changes in the operations of the political system because the political system is so integral to the way the economy functions and vice versa. Uh, overall, their proposed directions of change are really quite clear. Uh, in no particular order of priorities, they include fight corruption, double the GDP and double per capita income by 2020, which implies a 7% rate of growth, shift toward less reliance on exports and investment and more on domestic household consumption and services, uh, put a major new emphasis on environmental remediation, uh, focus on making the state more likable to the population, uh, more rule of law, more attention to the environment, better services, more transparency, 
less bureaucratism, uh, bureaucratism, less ostentation and special privileges for high-level officials and so forth. And finally, simplify the administration. I think we'll see a major restructuring of the state council in the National People's Congress that's about to come up. Uh, this is a wide-ranging and serious agenda. The question is, what should we really expect given the transition that is now uh, in progress? Uh, I think what we will see, and we have already begun to see in some instances, is a very quick start on rhetorical changes. Uh, Xi Jinping is quickly differentiating his style from that of Hu Jintao. Uh, I think on corruption, Wang Qishang will uh, quickly move to some high-profile corruption cases mm -hmm. to demonstrate that there's kind of a new sheriff in town, to use an American expression. Uh, Xi Jinping may be able to do better in directing the Politburo Standing Committee than Hu Jintao could for a whole series of reasons, uh, uh, partly simply different personality, but also a greater sense in China of the importance of significant reform at this point in time. Uh, also, who, uh, also, she, of course, is taking over as military head at the same time that he's uh, taking the leading position on the Politburo. I think there are fewer factional divisions on the Politburo Standing Committee now than there were when Hu Jintao took over and so forth. Uh, so I think there is going to be a fairly quick start. At the same time, I would argue that actual significant reforms are likely to come very slowly. Uh, and major reforms will take years if they occur at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and let me suggest why I am so cautious uh, in my uh, look ahead on this. Uh, in part, for the immediate future, there's still a lot of competition over who's going to get what posts on the new, newly structured state council. So this transition is by no means over. It's still very much in progress. But secondly, and much more importantly, there are very significant vested interests that are deeply... Uh, uh, focused on preserving the key elements of the system as it has existed in recent years. This includes the major state-owned enterprises under SASAC, and I am told SASAC is one of the few organizations that will not change in the reorganization uh, this coming March. Uh, the national level ministerial structures, what the Chinese call the Buman, are really bureaucratic empires, many of which will be quite resistant to change. Most important to me, uh, China has a five-level political system, you know, from national to provincial to city to county to township. Uh, the top couple of political leaders in each of those places have enormous scope of authority uh, and a lot of flexibility. Uh, and even if the orders for change come down, by the time they bump down through four levels, level by level, each with a lot of flexibility, uh, what you get at the coming out at the bottom at the operational level is often very, very different from what was uh, uh, pushed at the top. Also, while virtually everyone agrees on the need to reform, uh, I've been in trying a couple times in the last month and a half, I don't see any agreement on the specifics of reform. Uh, what is the order, you know, for politicians, the, the issue isn't what are the array of things we need to do, it's what am I going to put my political capital into first, right? How much political capital will I expend on it? How many people can I bring along on that, and how many enemies can I make mm -hmm. on it? You know, I don't sense any agreement at all mm -hmm. on that level of, uh, of agenda at this point. Uh, and also corruption, which I think is really growing in China a lot in the, in the last five years or so, from a substantial base to a huge problem. Uh, that corruption really uh, dissipate, dissipates discipline. Uh, and the fact that the 18th Party Congress said that we will fight corruption as a top priority, but the fight will remain within the Communist Party, not, at, not bringing outside judicial organs and that kind of thing, make me frankly quite pessimistic mm -hmm. about their capacity to deal with corruption. Uh, so overall, I think the odds are not good that substantial, effective structural change will occur in mm -hmm. China very rapidly, I think there's some question as to whether it will occur at the requisite level, even over a longer period. Now, let me conclude with just two comments, mm -hmm. if I can. I think I've got two more minutes. Uh, one is foreign specialists for a long time have gotten very good at analyzing the problems that China confronts. Uh, the Chinese, though, have a habit of surprising us with dealing with those problems more effectively than we anticipate they can. And that may be the case again. I mean, you know, the... Uh, the future is always difficult uh, to anticipate. Mm -hmm. uh, 
but my sense is that, that we're now dealing with a party that does face some higher hurdles. Uh, the greater extent of corruption makes it more difficult to impose discipline and to make uh, very significant change. Um, and the, uh, I'm sorry, there was one other point I wanted to make, I have forgotten what it was. But, but anyway, in a sense, this is a more loosely disciplined organization than we are accustomed to in the past, and therefore driving significant change against vested interests may be more difficult than we have come to expect uh, in the past. Uh, secondly, uh, the, uh, the question is, what happens if they don't drive the necessary change? And I want to be clear here. I don't think that the result of that is that Chinese growth comes to a halt very quickly or anything mm -hmm. like that. I think, in a sense, it's the same as what the U.S. now faces, the need to make major reforms, not because they have to be done to take care of things for the next two or three years, but if these reforms are not made in China or in the U.S., a decade from now, we're in deep, deep trouble uh, with a political economy that increases instability, that has its own drags on future growth, and those created problems that are probably not really manageable at that point. Mm. So we're talking about increasing friction and increasing problems, not going off a cliff, but uh, not taking care of now mm. the changes that need to be made in order to sustain dynamic growth uh, for the long-term future. Let me stop there. Okay, thanks. Dr. Zhang, so what do you think is the historical significance, let's start with that, of, of this particular transition? Thank you. Uh, I think the historical significance uh, of what has taken place in China needs to be substantiated and assessed at a later, later time. But I can say this. What has taken place in the last 11 months is very significant in the sense that it has demanded unprecedented level of humbleness and modesty on the part of China watchers and China specialists. Uh, beginning with the Bo Xilai affair, I do not think we even know the half of the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, I personally do not still understand why the relationship between Wang Neijin and Bo Xilai uh, went sour. Mm -hmm. The fundamental reason, despite all the reports on the uh, 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 episode, mm -hmm. We do not seem to know. And what happened on March 19th, what happened to uh, mm. Zhou Yongkang, uh, Liu Yuan, Zhang Haiyang, we don't know. Mm. Uh, and now we begin to see new pieces of puzzle, Lin Ji Hua's uh, implications, whether it's true or not. So, um, and also, what was initially revealed in, Mar in May about the uh, list of uh, top leadership after the Jingxi conference, that is completely different from what we now know uh, in November. So, and also the uh, very detailed reports and ex expose on the family fortunes of the high level leadership in China, that is also a big question, why that is happening at that particular uh, time and point. So uh, I think, as Ken said, caution, uh, modest, uh, I think humbleness uh, is what we need at this point in understanding uh, contemporary uh, Chinese politics. When uh, Xi Jinping came out and gave a speech on uh, November 15th, he said this, uh, This position is to be accountable to the people at large. It's, he sounded like a, 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 a popularly elected president. And I think he meant something by that. I think he wants to do something. Whether or not he can pull it off is uh, another matter. As we all know, uh, the current lineup of standing committee of the Politburo, uh, uh, he is the second youngest. He is surrounded by uh, soon-to-be elders. And we all know, at this point, uh, the influence of elders, including Zhang Zemin, Li Peng, Zhu Rongji, and even Chao Shi, who, who chose to publish his new book uh, right in the middle of all this. So I think elders still play a very important role. And given that, and given the fact that uh, Xi Jinping is the second youngest on the, on the standing committee of public bureau, how uh, uh, persistent his effort, whatever he wants to do, uh, can be, remains to be seen. Uh, obviously, I think he wants to deliver something. And I, uh, I was in Beijing last week. Uh, there are different versions uh, or editions uh, regarding Wang Qishan's uh, appointment to the uh, chairman of the uh, Central Disciplinary Commission. One version said he is so familiar with financial and banking sector, and given, given the fact that now the capital of flight is such a big issue in China, 
he is the right person to deal with that particular problem. Then again, the other uh, version said, since Central Disciplinary Commission is not really his functional s i t o n g so he will have difficulty in really pushing the cause uh, in the long run. So it all depends which version, which edition you uh, tend to believe. But I think uncertainty is the, the theme of the day. Uh, another thing I think, uh, we all know that the, uh, in China, uh, the frequency of popular protest has been increasing in the last 10 years. And even since 2005, the Chinese government does not publish uh, official statistics on popular protest anymore. Assuming, I, I mean, that makes me assume that the frequency is probably still uh, increasing. But up to this point, I think most of the participants in the popular protest were the ones who believed in the uh, the, uh, the fairness of the central government, whether that's true or not, that seems to be the belief, according to so many surveys. The participants in the popular protest think the central government is on their side. But what happened in 2012 may have changed this perception. So what may happen uh, in the years to come will create an enormous problem. Uh, in 1989, uh, during the Tiananmen incident, the major, major catalyst for what happened was that people began to know there was a crack in the leadership. And I think the most important thing that the Chinese leadership has to do at this point is to create an image that they are stable, they are united, but whether they can really pull it off uh, remains to be seen. I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you. Professor Chen Rong, please. Okay. Same question. Yeah, uh, thanks for the invitation first. Um, I, I, First, I'd like to stre- uh, stress on this point. Uh, the p- leadership transition this year itself uh, is very significant uh, because it is the first time uh, without a strongman to make the final decision. So everybody has to fight him for their own interests. Mm. Uh, this is a very typical uh, factional politics, something like LDP of Japan. <laughs> right? uh, there is no boss you know, to make final decision. Uh, we, we, we have uh, nine classmates mm-hmm. uh, with a retired senior uh, alumni. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so uh, this is the first time uh, we, uh, t- we, we see um, China enter, uh, how to say, the, uh, the, uh, the, the westernized uh, factional p- uh, politics, mm-hmm. people fighting each other. And, uh, The f- and the result uh, cannot make one side very happy and the other side in despair. Everybody feels unhappy, but everybody accepts the, con- the, the, the result. So that's good. Mm. Uh, f- from my perspective, I think that's a, that's a progress compared to the previous uh, strongman politics. Uh, so that's one thing. And uh, uh, some people uh, who uh, take a positive attitude uh, even defined uh, uh, President Hu Jintao as uh, George Washington uh, for i- internal party democracy. <laughs> He set the uh, president, right? And I, I think in the future, nobody can po- extend uh, their, their, their term. And he has to stop, or she, he or she has to stop at the, the second term. So that's good. Uh, that's one point. Uh, second point is that um, in, in the past three decades, The real uh, significant uh, political change is in the uh, state uh, society relationship. Uh, 30 years ago, we, we have a, a very strong state versus a very weak society. Now we have a more balanced society relationship, a uh, so- society, state society relationship. Uh, so the state has to uh, more and more uh, account for the pressure of our society. And now, what kind of society we have? Uh, as you may notice, uh, last year, our urban population surpassed uh, rural population. That's something that occurred in 20, uh, 1925 in the United States. So to, to some extent, t- today's China is equal to 1925 United States. Mm. Uh, so our urban population just uh, surpassed the rural population last year. Mm-hmm. And uh, 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 coming together with this uh, uh, phenomenon is that uh, we, we do have a 
uh, uh, rapid uh, emerging middle class uh, with uh, the largest uh, higher education population in the world. Uh, now the higher high, uh, the college students, the total amount of college students in China reached to 30 million, 30 million, twice as the United States. Um, and uh, then comes with uh, uh, internet, you know, urbanization, middle class, higher education expansion, and uh, internet means um, the new leadership, the new uh, leading group, they facing a new kind of pressure from our society, uh, different from those farmers. You know, for those farmers, give them a, a new job in the city, that's okay. But uh, you know, the demand for middle class is much more complicated. Um, so, uh, so that's the second point I'd like to address. The new leaders, they're facing a new society. Uh, and uh, we, we, we don't know what, what it means. Uh, that, but that definitely means challenge, right? And finally, uh, looking into the future, uh, how will they will react to the, uh, the pressure? Uh, there are two uh, key points uh, under my analysis. Why is that um, in the future, uh, China is a country running by a collective, collective leadership, a group of leaders, and no strongman can make a final decision. Uh, every people uh, on the top, he or she has to compromise, you know. So it's a result of a bargaining and a compromise. Something like the U.S. Uh, leaders, you know. <laughs> uh, nobody very happy, but uh, uh, acceptable, right? So collective leadership, uh, that's a logic to understand the behavior of the Chinese government in the, in the coming days. Second, China uh, will be an event-driven society. Um, only in a very short period, uh, China driven by theory, uh, the theory uh, accepted by Mao Zedong. Most time, China is a very uh, practical uh, society, driven by events. So, um, so um, try to find will the challenges uh, located ahead of China. Then you can guess uh, China Chinese government will respond to to those events. Mm. So collective leadership, even uh, or challenge driven. Uh, that's the two logic uh, to to find will uh, the new government will go. Stop here. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chung mentioned how how we need to be humble. We don't really know what happened and how how these people, um, the seven members, got to the standing committee. Perhaps, but the ones who did get there, uh, can we can we push your expertise a little bit and tell us about what you think are the personal characteristics? perhaps some of the backgrounds which you think might be define, the, the defining thing in this uh, uh, collective leadership. The, what, what is the personality behind it? What are some of the experiences um, that, that they can use to mold this political co collector lead, leadership into a particular direction? You're looking at me. <laughs> we'll start with anybody. Uh, let, let me just make a couple yeah. of comments to kind of kick it off. I, I, I frankly don't like getting into a discussion person by person yeah, at the yeah. top of the Chinese system. The, uh, 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 just to highlight uh, what Jay Ho was saying, uh, there are two ways to look at the standing committee. One is that uh, Xi Jinping is the second youngest person. The youngest person is the premier. Uh, and then they have mm -hmm. five older people above them. Therefore, their, mm -hmm. their leverage will be quite limited you know, in this kind of society and so forth. The other way to look at it is that these five older people are one-termers. Mm -hmm. They are, with the exception of one, Wang Qishan, they are all people who are kind of old pals in, in U.S. parlance. I mean, they're former municipal or provincial leaders who kind of know how to just kind of get along, make things happen, and move along, right? So they may be uh, more willing mm -hmm. to give Xi Jinping the lead. Mm -hmm. Uh, because they'll only be there for five years and then they face a long retirement and they may be more anxious to be in good stead mm -hmm. with the leadership that will remain after they have stepped down. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of these ways of looking at things says she will be quite limited mm 
really hemmed in by these older guys. And the other is that, in fact, it'll be quite strong because they're only one-termers. He's a two-termer. Uh, and uh, they'll be concerned with kind of getting through and then retiring easily. I frankly don't know which one of those will occur. Mm -hmm. uh, I will say it's, it's uh, two things about the selection of them. One is, if you think of the really strong personalities who had a really clear uh, set of preferences, right? I would have said from the Politburo as it existed a year ago, Bo Xi Lai, mm -hmm. Wang Yang, mm -hmm. Li Yuan Chao, and the last, maybe Wang Qishan, mm -hmm. uh, the first three didn't make it, mm. right? And with Wang Qishan, he made it, but with a portfolio that is not his, where his uh, strongest base is. Yeah. yeah. So uh, this was not a selection mm. for, for talent and dynamism. Mm -hmm. You could argue that at the end of the day, uh, because of age limitations, there were only, uh, 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 for a Politburo of, of standing committee of seven people, there were only 10 eligible given age limitations, mm -hmm. two already taken up, Li mm -hmm. Keqiang and mm -hmm. uh, Xi Jinping. That leaves eight. If they couldn't agree to cut anyone out completely, what would you do? You take the five oldest who can ter serve one term and put them on and say to the three younger ones, you're going to get a shot five years from now. And that's exactly what they did. So this may have been a kind of uh, factional balance and weakness mm. that determined the ultimate composition of the Politburo Standing Committee. That may be wrong, but certainly that explanation fits all known facts. Mm -hmm. Professor okay. Chong. Uh, we, we don't know the exact factional uh, uh, connections or networks of these seven people. Uh, and therefore, I think, the, again, the role of the elders is very important. And I think the elders played a very significant role in changing the lineup that was already uh, originally arranged in May. And for this, for this, I think there were some straw polls conducted, particularly the last minute straw poll. And what I heard was 25 uh, outgoing Politburo members plus 10 elders voted. And because of that, uh, the Li and Chao Wang Yang uh, were out. And I, don't, I do not know exactly what the rationale was, but probably they wanted to create an image uh, younger people who could cause troubles like Bo Xi Lai and, and, uh, and even Ling Ji Hua uh, should not be on the highest uh, level of, of the leadership, uh, thereby uh, creating an image that continuity is the issue. Uh, the, uh, Liu Yinshan and uh, Zhang Gaori mm -hmm. were not mentioned as uh, possible candidates for the standing committee members up until uh, so I think they took the windfalls by, uh, with, uh, because of the fall of the, these two younger uh, leaders. The uh, question is, I think, the, uh, uh, the, given the style of uh, Xi Jinping, I do not think he will step on someone else's toes. I think he will be nice to uh, many other people on the standing committee. Uh, if we go back in the past 20 years, in the uh, Jiang Zemin's 10 years, in his first five years, he didn't really show his colors. In the second five years, he began to show himself. In contrast, Hu Jintao didn't show his colors in his entire 10 years. <laughs> so we don't really have a, a, a large sample to make generalizations about. So we'll see what happens with the Xi Jinping's 10 years. Mm. Um, I don't know one, one of them. Uh, mm. I got no chance. Uh, mm. Actually, I shook hand with uh, uh, Xi Jinping in 2003 uh, <laughs> when he visited Renda. Just shake hand, no words exchanged. <laughs> um, I uh, tend to think uh, 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 education, uh, young generation, uh, mm -hmm. that should be a key uh, term to define these uh, people. Uh, some people said that six of them belong to educated uh, young generation and some define uh, four of them. Uh, so as a uh, teenager grown up in the city and uh, then uh, went to countryside, um, I think uh, there's something uh, uh, um, impact uh, their, their mentality. Uh, so educated young generation, uh, that's one feature. Um, 
I think they know uh, something uh, in, in, in the grassroots. Uh, that's an advantage. Mm. Um, that's one thing. Another uh, thing is that, um, as Ken mentioned, five of them um, will, will leave next time. Mm -hmm. uh, so to some extent, this um, seven member committee is still a transitional one. Right. Um, so so uh, not, uh, how to say, think them uh, as a settled uh, a group. They will change uh, next time. And uh, uh, for Xi, uh, the top leader, um, uh, it's possible he will be more confident um, you know, as a, as a um, son of a, a senior revolutionary. Um, he don't need to to, to uh, show his uh, loyalty by paying a visit to Xi Baipo, you know. For, you know, as a, a grassroots uh, leader, uh, who he has to do that, you know, uh, to show his legitimacy to Xi Baipo. But uh, for Xi, it's just unnecessary, right? Nobody doubt about uh, his loyalty. So then he, can show his openness to Shenzhen. <laughs> you know, many uh, liberal intellectuals feel happy these, these days, in recent days, because uh, she paid his first trip to Shenzhen. I think that's very naive. <laughs> uh, so, um, so, um, so that's one thing. Uh, another thing is that she um, left Beijing at uh, 15, right? Uh, he's quite... A, his personal experience different from those um, uh, people like Liu Yuan. Uh, you know, people like Liu Yuan, they, uh, their father stepped down after the Cultural Revolution occurred. They, 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 they went uh, marginalized in a group. You know, as a teenager friend, they stay together. But, uh, um, but for uh, Xi Zhongxin, the father of our leader, he stepped down before Cultural Revolution. Uh, because Liu Zidan Sijian, because mm -hmm. uh, that a novel, right? So I think uh, he left uh, Zhongnan Hai in a more lonely way, you know? Mm. He, he just uh, stepped down by himself. But for those other uh, mm. high-ranking sons, they, they go together, mm. right? So there is something uh, different from him and the other uh, uh, senior uh, leader's son. Um, so anyway, um, I think uh, he's uh, quite com sh should be a very uh, competitive leader. I believe that. Thank you. Okay. Ken, you wanted to? Uh, yeah, let me uh, see whether I could pull this together just a little bit. Uh, the, uh, the need for major structural reform in China is very substantial. Mm -hmm. uh, the leadership that was chosen at the Politburo Standing Committee level is I would imagine not the list of people that any of us would have put together if we were putting together a group to promote major structural reform. Mm. Uh, even Li Keqiang, who, is, uh, who has a lot of ideas about reform, doesn't have the, a Zhu Rongji type personality. Uh, so uh, the issue, I think, may well end up coming down to, there's no question that there'll be some new stylistic elements and that kind of thing, and they'll do some things. If you're talking about major structural reform, especially given that this remains a transitional leadership for another five years, uh, it could well be that what we end up seeing is to, to highlight something uh, that Jin Sangrong said earlier, that the structural reform will be driven by events. And if there is some major sense of crisis, if this isn't a slow rolling evolution toward a more difficult situation, but if something galvanizes a sense of crisis, then that may be what ends up being necessary mm -hmm. to, get, to get the kind of tough decisions mm -hmm. and implementation mm -hmm. that the system really requires mm -hmm. for the longer run dynamism of the system. Speaking of uh, getting things done in priorities, what, what you've listed earlier, you listed this incredible list of... Uh, I'm happy to give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> ...list of <laughs> challenges facing the new leadership. So what are the priorities? What, what's the first thing that they need to do? What's the most important thing that they should try to tackle? Domestically, right. foreign? Why don't each of us list two, okay? Okay, uh, all right, you can for, list for two. The domestic <laughs> thing. Okay, because my, uh, my uh, 
number one mm -hmm. would be Huco reform. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, Sun Rung mentioned earlier there are 51 percent of China's citizens live in cities now. In reality, only 36 percent of, of China's citizens are urban residents. Mm -hmm. The rest are all migrants that mm -hmm. do not have urban residence privileges. Mm -hmm. That is a huge drag on China. You can't, it is the single biggest source of inequality of wealth in China now, mm -hmm. is the failure to mm -hmm. lift the hukou restrictions on becoming urban mm -hmm. residents. Uh, so that to me would be number one. Uh, and uh, I think number two is something that is vaguer, it will be harder to identify, but it's extremely important and got some attention in the Party Congress report which is separating the state from enterprises. Mm -hmm. uh, the Chinese expression, zheng qi feng kai, uh, that mm -hmm. uh, given the current massive intervention of the state at the enterprise level mm -hmm. throughout China, I think it's going to be very difficult for mm -hmm. them to make the kind of reforms and the kind of anti-corruption effort mm -hmm. that, that the system really requires. Professor Chung? Okay. Do I have to say just two, or can I say more? Oh, okay. <laughs> what do you want to say? <laughs> okay. Uh, Here's the in, question. Well, <laughs> In the short run, I, I would say we uh, anti-corruption drive. Uh, despite what I said about Wang Qishan, I think there is uh, some arrangement uh, being made. The deputy uh, to Wang Qishan is Zhao Hongzhu, who was uh, formerly a uh, party secretary of Zhejiang, now the deputy uh, secretary of the Central Disciplinary Commission. And he used to be the assistant to He Yong, who was the uh, minister of supervision. So I think he's very well uh, versed in uh, what he's assigned to do. And already we know that Li Chuncheng, who was slated for the governor of Henan, was arrested for corruption. Uh, this is the highest level of uh, personnel to be arrested right after the 18th Party Congress. Uh, he's not, still he's not such a big tiger. He's, I, I would say medium-sized tiger. But will this continue? Uh, uh, and will this satisfy people who have known uh, the, the problems with the central le leadership, not anymore with the local leadership only. The other one is, the obviously, as Ken said, the uh, central uh, uh, the state uh, enterprises, mon monopoly or oligopolies in many uh, key sectors. But we all know that the outgoing Hu Jintao, in his very well-written work report, made it very clear that state enterprise should be the mainstay of industrial development. And whether Xi Jinping and the, uh, the new leadership can really step over this line set by Hu Jintao remains to be seen. The other one is, interestingly, the, uh, the cultural uh, renovation and innovation. Uh, we have this person on the Politburo, Wang Huning, who used to be at Fudan, but he served not only Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, but now even Xi Jinping. And he is now, I heard, slated for uh, the uh, uh, Wenjiao, that is culture and uh, the education and science. So what will come out of this, particularly given the current emphasis on soft power and others that Chinese government has been giving attention to? Mm. Okay, uh, three points. Why is that uh, with uh, uh, Mr. Hu Jintao uh, clearly uh, stepped down? Um, I think uh, we will have no... Um, uh, the, the new leaders uh, will get more autonomy. Uh, you know, uh, during whose year, we 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 saw uh, the phenomena of Tonghui, coexistence of sun and moon. Uh, that's no good from Chinese uh, perspective. Uh, but with uh, Hu Jintao uh, clearly stepped down, I think the senior leaders will be more restrained uh, themselves to intervene. So that means new leaders will have more autonomy. So put forward and carry out their policy. That's one thing. Second, uh, definitely uh, the new leaders uh, will put the domestic challenge first, at least the uh, uh, first uh, two or three years. Um, you know, uh, there is a, a, a logic, a two uh, logic in China different from that of the United States. You know, in the States, the new leaders always promise change, uh, change we need, change we can, but actually he changed nothing. Uh, according to my study, 90% of their promise hollow out, only carry out the 10%. But uh, China is vice versa. All the new leaders promise I will change nothing. But when he uh, consolidates his power, he will change everything. <laughs> and when the change will come, after the third planner. 
You know, the first one just uh, focus on uh, division of labor. Second one usually will focus on uh, agriculture, mm. food. Food is always very important for China to feed 1.4 billion population. That's a job can only fully feed fulfilled by God, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, Chinese leaders has to do that. So second, uh, planner always focus on food. But the third one usually very important. The new leaders, new leaders will come out with some new ideas. So pay attention to uh, to should it be September mm -hmm. or November uh, 2014. Then we will see some new gesture. Mm -hmm. After that, um, um, the new leaders will do something more on foreign policy side. But before that, he will mainly focus on, uh, focus on uh, domestic challenges. For foreign policy side, he will more like to have a so called reactive approach. Mm. And uh, within China, I think uh, to put the economy uh, back to the fast track. Uh, that's the first priority. Uh, whether uh, by real uh, so-called uh, structural improvement or uh, push China's uh, industry to upper uh, value uh, chain, chain yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's not important. The important thing is that let the GDP uh, grows uh, up to 9%. Mm. <laughs> That's politically important, you know. Sure. The quality is not important, but put the economy back to the uh, fast track. That's important. Uh, you know, Chinese people be spoiled. Seven percentage is not acceptable, you know. <laughs> so he must do something to show he's capable and can <laughs> put the economy back to the uh, fast track. That's the first thing. Second thing, uh, he has to do something uh, in so-called anti-corruption. Uh, whether it's significant progress, uh, that's not important. Important thing is that he, he sent a signal to the public, I'm very serious on this topic, <laughs> so anti-corruption. The third one should be something relating with means and public, uh, uh, pub public welfare. Uh, and one issue I uh, can mention is hukou. Uh, I, I also think that's important. Uh, but hukou is very difficult. Uh, takes quite a long time, and I I tend to think um, next year uh, people like us will get a little more pay. <laughs> uh, and uh, the fourth one should be da bu zi. Uh, he he will downsize the, the the government in some way because Li Keqiang involved the, this effort several years ago, right? But not very successful. But uh, and I think this time. Uh, the le leaders uh, will do that again, downsize the government. And uh, uh, the fifth one should be uh, the restoration of fa zi, uh, the rule of law. Uh, in recent days, um, because the, uh, our uh, ongoing leaders stress too much on the value of a harmonious society, uh, the government, uh, especially local government, uh, usually compromise whenever they face so social unrest. But uh, uh, after uh, the new leaders finish, fulfill the jobs I mentioned above, that four, right? Economy, anti-corruption, public welfare, da bu zi, downsized the government, he, he, they, they will get quite a lot of credit, right? So the, their political position will be strengthened. Then I think the local government will be much tougher to mm. social unrest in the name of the restoration of the law of law. Mm. And, and in the past uh, three decades, the new lead leaders, none of them used the term harmonious society. You know? So that term finished. Mm. Uh, so that's my prediction. And the foreign policy side in the, com in the coming two years, mm. as I said, they are not very interested interesting in it. They, they, <laughs> they, they are forced to do something. But actually, he has no demand for foreign policy establishment. Mm -hmm. For us, the demand just don't make trouble for me. Mm. No, not a, want us to achieve something. Mm. Nothing they want. Mm. But what they want is just no trouble. Uh, stop here. Thank you. Uh, and, and this is going to be the last round uh, of of question before we open it up. But uh, 
I was actually going to turn to foreign policy. <laughs> you keep saying that it's not a priority, but if you know, so uh, among foreign policy issues facing China and the current leadership, what do you think is their priority on the one hand, and what should be their priority? Can you uh, want to go? I, I think yeah. uh, their uh, priority is likely to be very much as Jin Sangrum just said to. Let me put it in different terms, to tamp down tensions internationally so they can focus on the domestic side. Uh, their problem is that uh, uh, a lot of issues keep coming their way uh, to which they must react. And my sense is, frankly, on the territorial issues, uh, especially with Japan recently, their reactions have been stronger than necessary and are going to cause them much bigger problems in the future. Uh, let me put it very simply with the Japan issue uh, over the dispute over these small islands. China has for many years expressed its deep concern about remilitarization of Japan. I would have said a few years ago the chances of that were nearly zero. But I think that China's reactions to steps that Japan has taken, I do think Japan moved first, China's reactions have been so strong that they're increasing the chances of creating the type of developments in Japan that they have always feared. And that will take up a lot of their foreign policy agenda if there is some major incident, not a purposeful conflict, but a major incident that then escalates. Uh, I think we're into a very, very dangerous situation, and it will force China's attention back onto foreign policy, the leader's attention back onto foreign policy with implications U.S.-China relations, too. So uh, reactive is one thing, but how you react is also something very important. Professor Chung. Yes. Uh, I think one main major discourse in China is that China has too many domestic problems. Therefore, uh, China's leadership will be uh, totally preoccupied with domestic management. Therefore, they will not be interested in foreign policy. I do not think that is totally true. Uh, if you look at the Soviet Union, if you look at the U.S., despite the, the fact that both nations have had and have a lot of problems domestically, but that didn't really alter their external strategies. So I think uh, there is a canal of truth to that statement, but nevertheless it has to be taken uh, with a grain of salt. Uh, second, I think uh, Chinese use this term Gerji, which is a particular distribution of international power. And I think that Gerji is changing very rapidly. Uh, ten years ago, a lot of experts would predict that the Japan's economic power would surpass that of the United States by 2035. Now, many experts are predicting probably before 2020 or even at the earliest 2018. Of course, just surpassing in terms of economic power doesn't mean that much. But at least it perceptually creates an enormous impact. Uh, so I think it will make, uh, it, will, it will introduce some changes. Uh, and also I think in Xi Jinping's 10 years, uh, the cooperation and competition dynamics between US and China, the rank order might be reversed in, in its second five years. It might be co competition and cooperation rather than cooperation and competition. If we, if we uh, limit our focus to East Asia as, as, a, as an important stage, I think a stage for more fierce competition already being set. In, in rhetoric, pivot to Asia by the U.S., China continues to talk about peaceful rise. And in, in, in economic terms, it's the FTA or RCEP versus uh, the uh, TPP. An ALC battle, A2AD. Washington consensus, Beijing consensus, whether or not there is a content in it. So I think stages are set across different uh, areas. So I, so I think from the perspective of uh, uh, smaller regional powers, this whole trend is a bit uh, alarming. Uh, and also, China always says China will never seek hegemony, it will never take leadership. The second part, China will never take leadership, will become increasingly more difficult down the road. Not seeking hegemony, I, up to this point, tend to uh, give credit to what China has said. But I think China's discourse on anti-hegemonism has been directed mostly toward the U.S. 
I think this is probably wrong. I think the main audience for this anti-hegemonic discourse should be the smaller nations in the region. And I think that point needs to be uh, 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 relate to uh, people in China. I'll stop there. Mm. Thank you, Professor Chen. Mm. Uh, I think uh, for, for China, two uh, issues always on the top. One is uh, a stable U.S.-China relations. One is uh, a stable uh, uh, relationship with the neighborhood. So that's the major interest of China. As for what happened in Middle East, Syria, Sudan, China actually not very uh, interested in it unless China forced to do something. Um, and uh, in recent years, everybody knows uh, U.S.-China relations get some trouble, uh, lack of trust, not in good shape. So, um, so uh, to uh, make U.S.-China relations uh, be stable, uh, that's one thing. And uh, uh, we uh, Chinese side raised the term "xin xin da guo guan xi," new type of major country relations. But, uh, and China will try to do something in this direction, but uh, we, we, we don't know how to do it yet. <laughs> so we're still on the discussion. Uh, but uh, we, that's the direction. Uh, um, um, something equal to um, Henry Kissinger's book, uh, the last chapter, chapter of his book on China, uh, he used the term co-evolution, right? And China likes this term, co-evolution. Uh, so, um, so that's one thing. Based on this uh, new concept of major country relations, China want to make U.S. relation, U.S.-China relations be stable. That's one thing. Another thing is try to uh, make the tension uh, um, with the neighborhood uh, controllable. First step, and uh, then uh, to improve the relationship with the neighbors. Uh, Second step, um, but uh, then comes the problem. Uh, actually, uh, can raise the how to do it. How to do it? Um, uh, you know, even we determined to let the neighborhood share the benefit of China's economic growth. Actually, this term written in the Sabada, let let the neighborhood share China's. Uh, the, the benefit of China's economic growth. But uh, the problem is how to do it. Uh, but uh, I, I think the direction is very clear. We want to have a stable U.S.-China relations. We want, want to put the dispute with the neighborhood under control. Okay. Thank you. I'll now open it up to the floor. We have uh, staff standing with, uh, ready with uh, microphones. So if you could raise your hand, so I will, we'll get a microphone to you. Uh, please identify yourself and please uh, be as brief as possible as you can. Yes. David Shambaugh. Uh, thank you. Um, David Shambaugh from George Washington University. Uh, just one footnote on something Jeho mentioned about anti-corruption um, and the detention of the vice uh, party chief of Sichuan. I just heard over the weekend in Beijing that they've also just detained the wife of Ling Jihua in the last three days. Mm. So these maybe they're killing some chickens to scare some monkeys, but we'll have to watch where that goes. And what I'd like to do, though, is try and draw out uh, the, all three panelists, but all, all three of you, but particularly based on what Ken said um, about the systemic implications of where this party state and, and this nation, for that matter, is going, rather than just take a snapshot of where we are after the party congress. Um, Ken, you identified a number of um, impediments, really. Uh, you know, rhetorical reforms, uh, less, you know, likely substantive reforms, less likely major uh, resistance from vested interests, you know, agreement on specific reforms, and, and many other factors, all three of you did. So if, if that's the case, um, where do you see the party state sort of three to five years from now? You know, are... Can you three step back and say, is this uh, a party state in decline, in atrophy? Mm. Um, are we seeing the end of a dynasty? Are we seeing, or will Bill Overholt be right, and economic growth will stimulate systemic reform of the superstructure? Mm. Um, I'm just, you know, if, if indeed they encounter the kinds of problems that you've laid out, which I'm, I share with you, by the way, um, where are they going to be two, three, five years from now? 
Uh, let me quote one of my favorite philosophers, a man by the name of Yogi Berra, who said the prediction is always difficult, especially when it's about the future. You know? <laughs> uh, the, uh, I think that there are a lot of contingencies here that are unknowable at this point. Uh, has the party state been in some ways atrophying, if by that you mean uh, reduced discipline, reduced decisiveness, uh, more vested interests, more pushback from the population? Clearly that's been the case. Right? Will that be an evolution toward a more democratic and resilient form of state? And I stress evolution, not collapse and rebuilding. Possibly. You know, you look back at democratic transitions elsewhere, and that, you know, you that's been a kind of path there. Uh, will there be some galvanizing moment that on balance will tip this toward a more resilient, a kind of renaissance of a dynamic party state? Uh, that is quite feasible, but it's very risky. You don't know. If the stress is on, for example, short-term uh, increase in speed of economic growth up to 9%, they know how to do that. The problem is how to do that is the old model of development, not the new model of development, right? It's more investment. It's more ways to promote exports and all that kind of stuff. You get a temporary rise, but you further consolidate the obstacles to the kinds of reforms that are necessary for the longer term. So that makes, to my mind, the longer term a little bit less optimistic. But look, at, at the end of the day, uh, there are, these are things everyone is playing with. I will say in China now, what is, and I'll end on this, what is striking now when you talk to Chinese intellectuals uh, and even some Chinese officials is how many will say 10 years from now we have no idea whether the Communist Party will still govern China. Now, I happen to think it will. I'm not quite sure how it will have changed. Uh, and let me say, the, the uh, contemplating a serious collapse in the Chinese political system of some form is frankly truly frightening. I mean, the results of that would, would not be welcomed by any serious thinker. But dynamic evolution of the state uh, would be welcome, and I think there's uh, a lot of this is contingent. We'll just have to see how it goes. Okay, next. Uh, Linda, up here, up at the front, right. Thank you. Linda Jacobson from the Lowy Institute in Sydney. Um, I was struck when Bill Overholt was speaking this morning um, about Japan, instead of concentrating on economic growth, the interest groups took over. Now, um, we know that the influence of interest groups in China is increasing. Um, vested interests are strong, and one of the things everyone mentions is that one has to be able to curb um, the power of the vested interests. So I suppose my question to Jin San Rong would be, does Xi Jinping, in your view, have the political oomph, the political clout, to actually go after those vested interests, because otherwise China will face the same problems that um, were talked about vis-a-vis -vis Japan, that economic growth will um, stall. Mm. Question. Mm, you know, many people are uh, concerned about uh, this uh, scenario, so-called Latin Americanized. Uh, there is a Latin American trap for modernization. And uh, in my understanding, uh, the typical reason for Latin Americanization is that the public policy sometimes hijacked by special interest groups. And uh, this possibility, this scenario uh, also uh, exists for China. But I personally don't afraid of that uh, scenario. The reason is very simple. China is too big. You know, special interests can really control one discipline of China. Um, so so uh, as for uh, special interest groups, um, this is a, a phenomenon uh, become obvious now. Um, but uh, um, something like the states, uh, if you have only uh, two or three, uh, or very few special interest groups, then it's possible uh, the public policy will be hijacked by, uh, by, by the special interest groups. But if, if you have too many, over a dozen, right? So nobody can control that public policy. And the China's fortune is that China is so big. And I don't think those uh, clever uh, businessmen uh, 
can uh, really understand China. Um, so, so I'm not so afraid of uh, the influence of public uh, of special interest groups. Uh, the the impact is a fact now, but uh, um, but the the, sub, the the complexity of China um, means uh, no no special interest groups can control any of a uh, significant uh, discipline of China. I'm Lin Xiao of China. Um, there have been a lot of uh, speculations or gossips about personnel changes. And uh, uh, now uh, the party congress party is over and many questions are gone. Uh, more questions will be gone by March with the National People's Congress, Chiang Kai Um My question I'd like uh, the panel to comment on is uh, what are the more deep seated, uh, longer term factors or changes that will help shape China's future uh, and thus uh, the future of the world as well? Thank you. Uh, to my mind, the one word answer to the thing that will most have the biggest impact on China's future. Let me pause 10 seconds while each of you answer what is your one word response, right? My word is water. It is the lack of availability of usable water. Uh, through water. 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 Yeah. Uh, yeah. Throughout, <laughs> see I speak Chinese, right? <laughs> uh, seriously, uh, when you look at the statistics and look at the trend, the lack of availability of usable water, shortages of usable water throughout the North China Plain are already sharply growth constraining. Uh, the trends are dramatic. And I think that in the future, that will prove to be one of the biggest sources of internal tension and of constraints on economic growth uh, that we will see in China. So that, to me, is, is the big one. And the rest is small by comparison. Professor Chang, you want? Uh, let me answer this question uh, uh, jointly with uh, David. Um, I think the current leadership has to show, uh, at least in the short run, that they are trying very hard to, to do something for the people. Uh, because now, if you look at many surveys, not only all, uh, done in the uh, overseas, but also inside China, people's discontent is increasing. People are discontent with many things. It, many people think the system itself is unjust, or they are just unhappy about the compensation they get for the land misappropriated by local governments, or the environmental degradation because of the uh, continuing construction projects. Reasons are different, but people's discontent is increasing. So I think the current leadership has to show that they are taking this factor into consideration. And then in the mid run, I think they have to show to the people that they are doing something on the front of political reform. We all know that from the mid 80s, they have been doing these experiments with township village elections. But why that has not been uh, moved upward toward the county level or even uh, uh, higher? Uh, maybe that is one thing that they can, although they, I don't think they can do it at the provincial level, but they might be able to do it in the, in the, in the, in the level in between. But in order for them to do that, they need time. Maybe <coughs> Xi Jinping and the new leadership may use the first five years to prepare for it, and in the second five years they might uh, uh, do it. I don't know. But in order for them to do it, they first have to fix the, the, the system of local administration, because they haven't even decided on whether the county will be ruled by the province directly or by the city as, as it stands now. Uh, and I, another thing I think is the uh, Xi Jinping will focus most of his efforts on party construction, leaving economic work to Li Keqiang. But Party, party construction has been very difficult, well document by, documented by uh, David's book. But in order for the Chinese Communist Party to regain people's trust and in order to regain its own legitimacy, which was very high in the 1950s, I think they need to have something like 
what they did in 1981. In 1981, there was a very important resolution on the history of the Communist Party since 1949. And whether or not the current leadership really think that the, the present time is so uh, crisis-like and requires enormous uh, uh, measures to deal with uh, the problems, I, I, I'm not quite sure. I'm not sure whether they really think that way or they just want to patch up here and there to just muddle through. We have five minutes, and I have Bill Overholt, Jonathan Pollock, and then I want to give the panelists each a chance to say something about what's going to happen in the next five to ten years. <laughs> Prognosis. So, Bill. Uh, in all the discussion of various reforms, I didn't hear anything about financial reform. Uh, a year ago, China had a major crisis in the financing of the small and medium enterprises. And um, my sense uh, in talking with uh, many officials is that addressing uh, that issue through reform of the structure of the banking system, through reform of uh, through liberalization of interest rates, uh, possibly through some action on the currency, uh, might be a, a major priority. Uh, and could happen relatively early because it's a kind of technical thing that they can just decide. Uh, is, is that uh, not a priority or is it something we might want to add to the list? Uh, well, you could add it to the list. I think it's low-hanging fruit. I think actually, as I've talked in more detail about what to expect in China, what well, I've said repeatedly, in other forms is that uh, financial reform is probably what we'll see first. Uh, and it's in no small part because it can be decided by a small group at the top and implemented at the top, and it has repercussions in the system. It doesn't face all these other problems. Having said that, the one uh, caveat is we're still waiting to see who will be appointed to the various key positions in the financial sector, and that may give some better indication of what to expect. Uh just add one thing. Uh, the, uh, we talked about the stop or big ministry reform. I think one important content to that is to develop the People's Bank of China into a truly independent organ. I think that is an important change to be seen. Mm. Dr. Pollack here. Yes, uh, Jonathan Pollack from Brookings. Um, several of our speakers have alluded to the uh, contingent elements in forecasts about China. And part of that, I think, reflects the fact that the continued influence of both elders and retirees, shall we say. Uh, now, this is something that may be a phenomenon that is most pronounced at the time of party congresses. But I'd be curious, uh, just as a more general phenomenon, I mean, what we have now is a situation where people still very much in the prime of their lives. And I guess uh, for those of us who are advancing along, we think about this more and more. Um, what it, how, how do you manage the consequences of having so many people who were movers and shakers in the Chinese system, who are now at least nominally retired? Uh, how do you manage that issue in the context of wanting to see those now occupying formal positions having an ability to exercise their own influence, evolve their own strategies. If you still have a large and indeed every five years growing number of those who hover, how do you, how do you achieve your own, your own autonomy, your own power? Is that directed to anyone in, in particular? Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. Professor Chung, please. Uh, there is a system called Zheng Xun in China. It means a solicitation of advice. That has been substantiated in Jiang Zemin's interview with Wen Huibao in 1995. It has been also been written in the Tiananmen papers that Jiang Zemin used to go to see Deng Xiaoping on very important issues. It's called Zheng Xun. I don't know whether it's applicable only to Deng or to other elders. That I don't know. But we all know that the leaders uh, at the level of state council or above can maintain their steps and offices even after retirement. That means they, they are entitled to see the documents circulated, which means they have a uh, say. And also, as I alluded earlier, there were uh, straw polls conducted, 25 outgoing public members plus 10 retired. I don't know who those 10 are. So 
maybe this is what really、uh, Chinese mean by collective leadership.、Mm. So I'll give you one minute each, ten-year pro- prognosis for this leadership. Well, I started off saying that China is at a turning point, and if you look over the coming ten years, there's an interesting、uh, disjuncture between expectations of China internationally、mm. and expectations of China domestically. Internationally, all the analyses still assume an ongoing rise of China, very dynamic,、mm-hmm. increasingly powerful, becoming increasingly,、uh, you know, conceivably dominant. Right?、Uh, when you turn to domestic, all the analysis is about the problems and challenges and the difficulties of transition. How they do domestically will have a profound impact on what they do internationally. So, at some point, these two things will come into closer,、uh, closer alignment. Uh, as I've suggested, I'm not sure how it's going to work out.、Uh, but these,、uh, the capacity to make structural reform domestically、uh, and get that going in a serious way in the coming two to three years is crucial for China's、uh, long-term、uh, capacity to meet its own expectations and legitimate objectives. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Okay, uh, domestically, in the first five years, I don't think there will be big changes. Maybe,、uh, as Chan Long said, events-driven, so there will maybe some patchwork here and there. Second five years, I hope、uh, there will be more for uh, the, uh, uh, the progressive reforms on, on, on different aspects. In terms of、uh, foreign affairs, In the, fir- in the first five years, I think China will continue with、uh, the principle of whole far jiren, which means China will not provoke first, but once provoked, China will respond with a massive uh, retaliation. Uh, in the second five years, I'm not quite sure. So uh, hopefully, uh, nothing big will happen. Mm. 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 Um, uh, although uh, our economy will slow down for a while, uh, mm. but uh, uh, generally speaking,、uh, the, the coming decade. China will still experience a, a golden age、uh, for economy, and、uh, by the end of this uh, decade, uh, China's GDP will surpass the United States. So that's one thing. And、uh, the challenge, mainly on social uh, side, uh, the newly emerging middle class, uh, they they will、uh, put a lot of challenge uh, to uh, on the table of Politburo, and、uh, so that's the major challenge comes from、uh, social side. Uh, political reform,、um, you know, the official attitude that is that we we reform the all the times, right? <laughs> But <they> never <laughs> fulfill your expectation. <laughs> that will be the answer. The reform we are going on. But、uh, in Chinese characteristics, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> that brings this、uh, first opening、uh, plenary session to a conclusion. Please join me in thanking the panelists for a great conversation. Thank you.